Hi, Dave. I'm Mizelle from The Upcoming. It's really lovely to speak to you today. Congratulations on this fantastic series. I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, Thanks, Mizelle. Nice to meet you. You too. So um, perhaps we could sort of start. What is the series House of Ninjas all about? What can viewers kind of expect when they watch it? Well, House of Ninjas is a story about the last ninja family who are still, uh, you know, alive and and uh, but they are retired. They have left the life behind. And this is the story of basically them coming back because uh, Japan needs them. So it's a, it's an exciting action adventure, um, but also, but it's also you know a, a story of family and and a, a story about you know I, I hope that anybody with uh, anybody can relate to. You know, I think what I find really interesting is you kind of blend that kind of old tradition of of the ninja kind of genre in a really modern Japanese setting, you know, because obviously, you know, you talk about things like the Fuma clan, and I believe that kind of expands in like the 17th century. So what was the choice to kind of bring that into the modern setting? I mean, that was all, you know, um, so Kento Kaku, who stars as Haru, uh, was also the originator of this this whole series. That was sort of part of his initial pitch was, was basically that they have the ninja traditions, but they're in the modern time. Um, now, you know, ninjas were sort of the spies of their day. So if you if you really do, if you really update sort of in, 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 a, in a completely realistic sort of setting, it would just end up being just a spy show, I think. Um, but we wanted to really keep the flavor and the tradition and, you know, the iconography of, of what it looks like, what it feels like to be a ninja. Um, so that's why, you know, they, they still use the weapons that they've used for hundreds of years. That's why they still, you know, they have updated outfits that they wear when they're on, on their missions and everything. But they're still, you know, you still look at them and, and uh, you know, that's a ninja. Uh, <laughs> no, we, we really wanted to make sure that we were kind of keeping that. Um, and especially because, you know, the more we, we sort of researched, it just felt like there was such pride in the whole shinobi identity uh, in real life. There's, you know, there's there's various sort of religious ties to it. There's all kinds of, they had a, a whole sort of code of behavior that they live by and everything. We found it hard to believe that they would abandon all that. And and so that was part of why we decided to have them be an iconic, nin, you know, shinobi family that has passed down all these traditions for years and years and years. And that gives us an excuse to have this wonderful house that's full of all these, uh, you know, 19th century traps and weapons and, and fun stuff like that. And obviously, like you're saying, in terms of the research, I mean, can you talk a little bit about how you guys both kind of delved into that? And and also, I mean, I know there's like one real ninja left. Uh, I'm going to say his name wrong, but it's uh, Junichi Kawakami. Did you get a chance to, I think he's in his 70s or something, did you get a chance to kind of meet up with him and hear any of his stories as part of the research as well? We didn't get a chance to meet up with Kawakami-san. We did talk to uh, a lot of our primary focus of research was uh, um, uh, Professor Yuji Yamada of, of uh, Mia University, and he's kind of the preeminent scholar in terms of all things, in ter terms of all things ninja, and he's been a great sort of cheerleader and champion for the show. Um, you know, when, when I initially got this job, I had a really short time to write a show Bible that, that they would, that they decided to move forward with. Um, and at the time I was just engaged as a writer, you know, I, I eventually sort of took on more responsibility. So I was kind of limited to what I, and I was in the States at the time. So I was a little bit limited in, in what I could access. And what I found was that there was just a, a great deal of inconsistency among all the sources about, you know, about various things in ninja history. And, uh, just because there's so much that we don't know where fact, be, you know, where fact ends and legend begins and vice versa. Um, that it's hard to know the whole truth. So we tried to just make our best guess and go with the most, the stuff that we found the most interesting. Um, and then, you know, once, once Netflix kind of gave us the, the green light to develop the, the scripts further and everything, uh, we had a researcher on the staff, her name was Kan Nakimura, and, uh, and she did a great job, you know, interviewing various ninja experts and then bringing that back to us and to the directors and to the writers to sort of, to engage, you know, and put that in, in the in the show. And then we promoted her to writer and she wrote episode six. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think obviously in terms of the cinematography, I mean there's a line that's repeated a little bit through that's like the best shinobi are like shadows, no one knows we exist. And and was that kind of the basis for some of the cinematography? Because you can see this 
you know, the darker sort of more secretive palette that runs through it. Yeah, we talked a lot about how, you know, there there's uh ninjas or they're they're creatures of the night and and uh so we we didn't we didn't want it to feel artificially you know artificially too bright and just giving enough so that you can see exactly what's going on but also let the ninjas kind of slink into the shadows and disappear completely <laughs> when when we needed them to story-wise so so that was a big challenge you know for every department um whether it's production design or lighting or or uh or camera department um, but, a, but a really fun challenge as well. Um, just making sure that we're, you know, a, a lot of times we just wanted to see just a, wait, what was that kind of, kind of thing. And, uh, you know, just, just letting, um, letting the ninjas kind of move in and out of the shadows as, as they need to. So. And I guess obviously with with folklore, these ninjas do have a lot of sort of superhero powers, and and you bring that in. Was it important to have that in the action scenes to kind of bring in that authenticity of the folklore of them as well? Yeah, we we try to um, you know everything in the show has a practical explanation where there is a skill involved in it, but maybe when you when you watch it from the outside, it looks like they have supernatural powers just because they're so they're so good at it so a lot of that was from you know the the skill the the, the kind of things that we saw in our research um and and maybe some you know there's like the the clone duplicate technique where a ninja can suddenly appear to be in multiple places at once and we have that several times in the show in subtle ways kind of our version of it um, but it's, it's a very grounded and, and sort of realistic version of it. And, you know, even though we don't explain it, there is, there are, it's, 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 uh, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for how they do it. Okay, that, that kind <laughs> of. So we always wanted to, you know, have to, to kind of pay homage to all of those things that especially fans of ninja folklore and ninja stories love, but kind of have our own spin on it. Um, you know, our, our whole kind of concept around this this story was was that uh you know ninjas have basically been under our nose this whole time for hundreds of years and um and so we wanted to kind of integrate those little ninja skills into everyday life instead of having them be you know the, the kind of flashy versions that you might have seen in uh in, in other ninja stories and we'll see in terms of uh collaborating with kento kaku i mean he was also in the lead so he you know he's taken on quite a lot of the action himself what was that? Uh, how did you kind of team up from the beginning um, and take on this project? And what was that collaboration like working with him? It's funny. We, um, you know, he he, he kind of gave Netflix the blessing to take his project and, and let somebody sort of take the wheel for a second and develop it for, for, for a beat. And so the first time he ever saw my name was when somebody handed him the show Bible, you know, that said by Dave Boyle on it. And, and until, until that point, he didn't, you know, he didn't know who I was or anything. He just sort of was waiting for Netflix to respond with something. You know, he, uh, you know, immediately just felt, uh, we felt a kinship with each other. I, I did from, you know, from reading what he had done and he did from what I had done. And so once we finally met, and and we just found that we just really had similar tastes that we wanted to make the same thing um and he's just such a dynamic you know he's kind of doing something like this you know being sort of like the tom cruise where you have your your franchise that you take and shepherd through the the studio system is a little unusual in japan these days there, there may have been incidences in the past like it but he's really a, a really dynamic focused um very very good producer um and he you know shepherded this thing through the beginning and i it was just sort of lucky that we we had this this uh uh you know friend in common who brought me into it and then you know we we just we just got along like gangbusters it was just a great collaboration and obviously in terms of the music as well, I mean, that really drives it forward as well. I mean, you work with, I think it's Jonathan Snipes, I think he does the score. You know, yeah. what was that like as well? And what was the choices for that? Yeah, Jonathan is a, boy, he's just such a terrific composer. Um, you know, we we talked a lot about, we, we wanted the score to really feel really dynamic and bold and emotional and, and also singular. You know, we didn't want it to sound necessarily like, you know, make it sound like such and such, that kind of thing. Um, and one thing I love about Jonathan is that every single one of his scores just sounds so different from each other. 
and he has just he has such a unique voice that just really kind of cuts through it just really sort of stands up it makes you stand up and take notice um and i felt like you know we were taking a, a fairly uh you know as far as it goes a pretty grounded approach to um the presentation of the of the visuals and, and the family and the acting and all that and i felt like the thing that the show needed to uh, as a sort of counterpoint was was a score that was just very emotional and driving um operatic in a way like some of the the influences that we talked about were like giallo movies from from the 70s where you have these these plots that were just about just just in the the you know just the most insane subject matter um and then it's played totally straight and then the score is just the score the music just totally brings you into it and you know we're sort of dealing with the kind of you know not dissimilar b movie material here um and but we're taking a very very straight and very emotionally vulnerable approach to it and i just really felt like you know that kind of score would would uh would really drive it home um, and so I, I just asked him to just, you know, give me a sound that we hadn't heard before. And he absolutely delivered a thousand percent. Yep, definitely. And I think obviously in terms of the dynamics of the family, I mean, I guess in ninja movies, oh, things that we've seen, it's, it's all about the action and you never really hear about the families and that, you know, it's a little bit dysfunctional, the emotions of them. And also in the modern world, the traditions that don't you know that guests don't work finding love in it you know and things like that so um what did you find interesting or relatable because I, I do know that you had a, a mormon upbringing so did you feel that kind of relatability when you were working on this and did you want to bring that in because of that oh for sure i, I mean i i always felt like this, especially when you you know whenever you write something whether it's whether you're writing it for yourself or whether it's it's a it's a job or an assignment that comes your way i always feel like I need to find some sort of personal connection to it or some sort of way in. And that was my way in. Um, you know, ninjas have all these these sort of codes of behavior. They're not drinking alcohol, not eating meat, um, you know, no, no dating without sort of approval, always sort of following the the the, the word of your your master. And and so I felt like I, I, I did sort of feel like just imagining imagining them as a Mormon family made it easier for me to write because because <laughs> it's you know uh, I, I can't move like a ninja or, or anything but I can I can understand sort of the that whole mode of you know trying to live by a very very old code of rules in in modern times and sort of so I, and then trying to explain that to people is is also very difficult and and then also every member of the family has different feelings about you know about their whole identity as a, as ninjas and how committed they are some of them want to go back some of them never want to go back and and so it just felt like that was that was sort of my way into the emotional side of the story and, and made it easier for me to, to write. And, you know, and that, that was also something that we talked about with the, the whole creative team and, and, um, you know, and, and had a lot of fun just, just sort of, you know, uh, and all, all that stuff is, is with a light brush because, because at, at, at its core, this is, you know, a really fun, playful, you know, hopefully suspenseful uh, mystery story, but, but the emotional way into the characters was was definitely something that was very personal for me. Oh, I think I guess that's and it makes it very unique as well, I suppose. But the other thing is that I mean, you worked on like Big Jeans, Little Tokyo, and What and Rise. You know, as a storyteller, what is it about this kind of Japanese culture? And also, you learn Japanese as well. So, what is it about the culture that appeals to you so much that makes you want to get involved in that kind of side of the storytelling? Um, you know, I I always uh, I'd always loved. Uh, Japanese movies and everything um, but you know my introduction to learning Japanese and Japanese culture and everything was actually really sort of a, a side just a totally left field kind of thing like the is actually the Mormon connection because um, you know Mormon folks when you turn 19 you go on a mission and uh, you go to a foreign country and um, and uh, sort of do missionary stuff uh i was sent to australia but i was assigned to um learn to speak japanese because they had a japanese language congregation there and i just um really uh fell in love with the with the language and the the culture i, I had a really you know i really loved 
that experience of of learning to speak the language and everything and then my first film was actually sort of really uh about that experience you know um but it was really through that that uh making that film that i was just sort of introduced to a lot of just wonderful you know japanese and asian american actors and, and uh just you know made a lot of connections with people who ended up being um really really close collaborators who i wanted to keep working with and um and that turned into sort of a string of independent films that that, that i was able to make and, and just wonderful wonderful experiences and everything yeah and then you know the, this this time i i think it was it, while i've written tons and tons of stuff that you know is in very that either you know didn't get made or is in various stages of development or whatever uh this time i i think i was lucky that i had that background i was i'm able to speak japanese and everything so that even though i got the i got the job to 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 write the write the show and everything i was able to stay involved and and uh and you know expand my role to direct and everything just because i'm i'm able to i'm able to do that in japanese so i i, I was about to say so i don't skip a beat but i, <laughs> I that's that's maybe overstating my abilities a little bit but yeah <laughs> well, I guess it was easier to be on set as well, speaking the same language as well. So thank you so much for speaking to me um, and congratulations. Good luck with it all. It's really interesting. Thank you so much for speaking to me. It's very unique. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.